a Christmas story. <laughs> now, before you get excited, this is not the Christmas story that is about a one-legged Italian lamp from Fragili. I know many of you would like to hear about the lamp from Fragili, but today we're going to share a story about a slightly, well, a slightly different Christmas story. Many of us are familiar with the Christmas story that, that Linus has made famous and shared to us from the Gospel of Luke out of the second chapter. And my hope and my expectation is that this Thursday evening, on Christmas Eve, we will have an opportunity to share that story. But there is a Christmas story that takes place before the Christmas story. And I think sometimes it is lost. It is overshadowed and lost by the Christmas story that we know. We, we, we know about a census being taken, that, that Quirinius called for this census, and we know that, that, that Mary, who was great with child, traveled with her betrothed husband, Joseph, and we know that story. But the Christmas story really starts earlier than that. And so by the grace of God, by the anointing of God today, I, I believe that it is time for us to share a prophetic word from God's Word about the Christmas story. If you'll join me, not in the second chapter of Luke this morning, but in the first chapter of Luke. We're going to begin this morning in the first chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. He was of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. They had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Zacharias was a temple priest. The, the scripture tells us that, that his position was that of one who burned incense in the temple. This is truly an Old Testament Jewish priest burning incense in the temple of Herod. Really the temple of the Jews, but referred to as Herod's temple as he had rebuilt it. He was betrothed to a wife, Elizabeth. We remind ourselves that in the day and the age when the scriptures were penned, that a woman such as Elizabeth, if she was barren, she was considered cursed of God. A child was more than just a child. A child was an inheritance. A child was a legacy. A child was a future. It is difficult as it would be just for the inherent maternal nature to want to nurture a child. There was more culturally and socially about this. She, she literally was considered a woman without a legacy, without a future, without a retirement plan. Should Zacharias die, there was no one in the family, there was no son, no child to care for her. She was considered not just barren, but she was culturally considered cursed of God. Zacharias, as was his custom, he would go into the temple to burn incense. Verse 10, the multitude of the people were outside praying at the time of incense. And there appeared unto Zacharias an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. You know, there's a funny notion in our culture. We assume that angels are these cute little things with white fluffy wings and... and but curiously enough, whenever you read in the scriptures that someone encountered an angel, they generally trembled with fear. Amen? The, the angels that God sends both to dispatch a, a, a blessing to minister unto us, as well as the angels that are set to care for us, they are not meek and timid, fluffy, cloud-filled, wing-filled little creatures. <laughs> they are beings of light, but they are beings of war. And they are mighty, created by a mighty God Amen. for mighty purposes. Hallelujah. Amen. The angel Gabriel appeared unto Zacharias. Zacharias, he trembled. He was filled with fear. 
Verse 13, but the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias. I always love that greeting. They always do that. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. They show up, they scare the guy to death, and they go, oh, fear not. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Yeah. Why don't they say that before they show up, right? Why is it there's just like a little Bible memo that says, hey, something really amazing is getting ready to happen. Don't be afraid. It's going to be a little overwhelming. They don't ever do that. They show up, they overwhelm the moment, and they go, hey, don't worry about it. It's okay. Don't fear. Amen. A text message. That's what they should have done. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Somebody here today needs to hear the voice of the Lord. If you don't hear anything else out of here today, fear not. Your prayer has been heard by the Lord. Hey! Come on, somebody. Hey. Fear not. Your, your prayer has been heard Hallelujah. by the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. This is not John, the writer of the Gospels. This is not John, the writer of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, the epistles. This is not John, the writer of the book of Revelation. This is a different John. This is John the Baptist, one who was the forerunner of Christ. He was, he was known as one coming in the spirit of Elijah. It's, it, it's very interesting as we insert this story right here, as we've stepped for a moment out of our series that we've been sharing on Malachi, for Malachi prophesies of one coming in the spirit of Elijah. Now we read of this same man, this same John, who came in the spirit of Elijah to announce he was the forerunner of Christ. He was, John was, John was a priestly man. He was... John was known for sometimes wearing unusual clothing, but standing in the wilderness and shouting out, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight your paths. Make right your way of going, for the Lord is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the John of whom we speak. This John also, while Christ was in his earthly ministry, this same John lost his head. But he lost it because he spoke the truth. The angel said unto Zacharias, Thy prayer is heard, thy wife Elizabeth, she shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall receive at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. It's a Nazarite vow. It was a a vow of consecration, a, a lifestyle that he would live, a lifestyle that would say that there were things in this world that were far less important than the purposes, the righteousness, and the holiness of God. But this is, this is, this is the phrase that lights me up. And John shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. There is something that occurs frequently in the Old Testament that we read about. We read in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, about people having the Holy Ghost come upon them. There's a temporary season, a moment, of a place where a person was called to do a great task or to deliver a great word, and the Spirit of God came on them for the purpose of that task in that moment. But then there's this other event this New Testament event where one becomes filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with a permanent indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And this angel Gabriel says unto Zacharias, your son John shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even while he is in Elizabeth's womb. Now, just for a side note, for those that say that life doesn't begin until birth, I would point out that this child was alive and well in its mother's womb, so much so that it could receive the Holy Ghost. It could be baptized in the Holy Ghost. It was a living person in that mother's womb. Though it had not yet come forth, it was a living child. There was a precious life there to be valued and cherished, so much so that the, the, the purposes of God were manifest in this child in the womb. Yes, sir. Imagine mm -hmm. if the life of this child, John, had been taken mm -hmm. before birth. The purposes of God that were manifest in this child, and this child was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Well, how did that happen? Glad you asked. Because we're going to keep reading and find out. <laughs> Many of the children of Israel, they shall be turned by this John unto the Lord their God. Scripture doesn't say they shall turn and follow John. It says that John shall turn them and point them to the Lord. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. There is oftentimes discussion, particularly in, in spirit-filled circles, about the children returning to the fathers. But if we read the scripture carefully, it says that this spirit of Elijah that is coming will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. I ask you today, where are the men? Where are the fathers? Not, not just the biological fathers, but the spiritual fathers. Where are the mentors, the disciplers? What move of God will it take to stir the hearts of mature men to have compassion? Where, where is the spirit of Elijah that will cause a grown man who is mature, upright in his walk, to look at a teen whose underwear is hanging out <laughs> and say, I, I want to love that young man into the purposes of God. I don't like his music. I sure don't like the way he talks. I don't want to see his underwear. <laughs> and there's some other problems I've got. But there is a spirit of God that is able to overcome all of that physical, worldly objection. Praise God. I rejoice for a God who, when we were yet once adulterers, fornicators, liars, drunkards, thieves. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Lord. Who turned his heart to us. This spirit of Elijah is to cause us, men, I'm speaking to you right now, to, to, to cry out in desperation for those youth, to be moved to tears in our prayer rooms for them. Ladies, you may do the same for the daughters. When will we, the generation, who consider ourselves mature and upright, who sit back in our holy huddles, when will we grieve and cry out and reach out to another generation? Amen. The spirit of Elijah should be breaking our heart for them. It's just what the scripture says. John the Baptist, he shall go before the coming Messiah in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Yeah. Now I might be reading into that. I've got my dad pants on. I might be reading into it, <laughs> but I... I believe that when it refers to the disobedient, it is referring to a younger generation which is perhaps not refined in their understanding of the things of God, some of whom might be just downright rebellious. Now, fortunately, none of us who are now mature and righteous ever took that journey. We can't relate because we have no idea what that was like. Not a rebellious bone in our body, but, but we can try through the anointing of the Holy Spirit to relate to these young people disobedient, <laughs> that they will be turned to the wisdom of the just. <clears throat> One of the things that I so desperately desire when I go out to the prison and I minister to the young men, they are 14 to 20 years old. They are in the state prison system as convicted felons for the frequency or severity of their crimes or both. But I often say to them, and, and, I, and I know it's, it's fruitless, but it's just who I am, and I can't help but say it. I, I know it's not what's going to transform their life. It is the power and presence of God that's going to transform their life. But I said, you know, if I could just, if there was some way I could, could, could force into you some of this knowledge, if I could save you some of the time and the heartache and the years that I've wasted, the pain that I've caused, if there's something at your age, from my age to your age, if there was some way I could impart into you something 
It would cause you not to lose those years that I lost. Not to cause the pain that I caused. Not to still suffer the consequences that I suffered because you, 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 you just... And I know I can't, but the desire is there. And the desire comes from God. The desire to care about others comes from God. It is not innately a part of us. If we have that desire, rejoice in it because it's not from you. Amen? If, if you have the desire to be compassionate in serving of others, it is of God. That Amen. goodness comes from God. It is not innately a part of who we are. Amen. What will transform their lives is the word of God and the power of God and the presence of God. And if somehow I can be used by God to impart some word or some message, if you somehow can be used of God to impart the presence of God, the word of God, the truth of God, the example of God to a younger generation, you are fulfilling scripture and the purposes and the plans of God. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well stricken in years. Zacharias is smarter than some of us think. Notice what he said. He said, I'm an old man. He didn't say, and she's an old lady. He said, she's stricken in years. I'm an old man. She's got a bunch of extra years. Zacharias Made it, it feared the angel, but he feared his wife, too. He knew better than saying she's an old woman. But he said, he said, I'm an old man, and my wife is, well, stricken in years. Strange. The angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel. Notice what he says. Zacharias, you didn't get a 13th-tier angel. You got Gabriel. I'm Gabriel, Zacharias. Relax. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. Behold, listen up, Zacharias. Thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day of these things shall be performed, because you believe not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them, but remained speechless. And it came to pass, as the days of his ministration were accomplished, that he departed to his own house. And after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach. There was a promise from God that seemed impossible. Hmm. Come on, you're preaching ahead now. Hmm. There was a promise from God which seemed impossible. Hmm. This story reminds me of another couple in the Old Testament. Hmm. Abraham and Sarah, who stood there and said, Do you know, God, the womb is too old. The womb is dead. It is, it is, it is past the birthing season. And God said just a word. Just a word that I will release unto you, and you shall bring forth a son. Amen. Just a word I will re come on, somebody. Amen. Just a word I will release unto you, and no longer will you be barren. Amen. If there's somebody that is thinking their season is past, there is somebody that is thinking that you are barren. There is somebody that is thinking that it is too late. It was not too late for Sarah and Abraham. It was not too late. Come on, for Zacharias and Elizabeth. Because with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. Hallelujah, we agree. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's presence, this same angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. He was sent to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph. This Joseph was of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came unto her and said, Hail! Mary, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw Gabriel, she was troubled at his saying. And cast in her mind, wondered in her mind, what manner of greeting this should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, Hallelujah. and shalt call his Glory. name Jesus. Amen. 
there are some who doctrinally teach or suggest that Mary didn't actually give birth to Jesus, that, that the God was just placed in her womb. Just me, I guess, but, but when I read my Bible, it says that she conceived. The angel said, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. We have within the scripture... What is probably, without a doubt, the most difficult concept to understand in Scripture. I would say that perhaps this is even more difficult than understanding the triunity nature of God. I didn't say the trinity nature of God, I said the triunity nature of God. As hard as it is for us to wrap our mind around that, to, to understand how this Jesus could be fully God yet fully man. There was no biological paternal father. She was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit of God that brought this life to bear in her womb. Holy but the Scripture tells us that it was Mary, of Mary, that this flesh life was Amen. consumed. Yes. By Mary, she was fully, he was fully human. By God, he was fully God. And he persisted in the flesh, approximately 33 years of his earthly ministry. Fully God, fully man. The God part of him never ceased being God. The God part of him had the knowledge of the scriptures. We find at the age of 12, he sat in the temple. And the wisest doctors of the law, the knowledge, the scriptures, they were astounded at his, his knowledge. Well, yeah, because you're sitting with the author of the book. <laughs> they're asking him questions about a book that he wrote, and then they're surprised how good his answers are. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, fully God in that moment. Yet he had this fully human side, and, and I believe that that is the side that the Holy Spirit came for. You see, he was fully God, and, and, and he never surrendered that deity in the flesh but he was fully man with all the weaknesses of the flesh and just as you and I in our flesh desperately need the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit need to be filled with the Holy Spirit sanctified with the Holy Spirit that flesh side of Jesus needed the sanctifying presence and power of the Holy Spirit there in the example for how we are to live our lives Amen. as believers Amen. and men and women of faith Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary, being a bright young lady, said, How? <laughs> How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She had not had sexual relations with a man. She was truly a virgin. And you know, it's kind of fun to ponder the fact there's really not any debate about this issue. Even probably the most contrary, largest world religion to Christianity, what some would call the actual enemy of Christianity, doesn't even debate the virginity of Mary. In fact, their holy book, I've been told, confesses that Mary was a virgin. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I've been told that their holy book confesses that Jesus was the only one born without a biological father, even in their book. They confess that Mary was a virgin. And they confess that Jesus, forth, Jesus Christ came forth from her womb. They simply say he's not the begotten Son of God. Their book says that God has never begotten a son, but Mary was a virgin and she had a son. If there was no paternal dad, I'm kind of... That'd leave a lot of other options, does it? Kind of ironic, right? Yeah. Kind of ironic that, that, that someone has a holy book that says that God's never conceived a son, yet there is this woman who didn't have a husband and she had a son. 
I had to be a a father man. somewhere. A I'm going to let them try to figure out how to sort that one out. But, but if you ever have a discussion with one of them, please know that you stand on solid ground and theirs is pretty shaky. In fact, you could even say that it's built on something that just doesn't add up even <laughs> by their own scriptures. Just a free nugget for you to take with you today. <laughs> how shall it be, seeing that I know not a man? Gabriel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Notice what it says, that holy thing, not that holy man. He's not just a holy man. It's something that's never existed before on the face of the earth. A holy thing, a, a thing which the scripture really doesn't even have a word to describe in this context. A thing which has never existed. A being which is fully God, yet fully man at the same time. This, this one, this being that shall come forth, this holy, set apart, consecrated one, shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. I remind you that their book says that God has never begotten a son. Their book and this book cannot coexist. Cannot. There is no reconciling those two points. You may believe their book or you may believe this book, but there is no union, no marriage, no combining of these two. One is truth and one is not. Choose life or choose death. It is your decision to make, but one book is right and one book is wrong. And your eternity hangs in the balance as you choose. Just for the record. <laughs> the highest shall overshadow thee. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And by the way, your cousin Elizabeth, she's also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her pregnancy who was called barren. For with God shall nothing be impossible. Amen. Mm -hmm. I choose to repeat unto you today the words that were shared a moment ago. You have Elizabeth who was so advanced in age, who believed she was past the place of birthing, who believed that she was barren. You have Elizabeth representing a person, a human, who believes that their season is past. And then you have this Mary who believes that her season is not yet. Because she's not yet done the works necessary to achieve the birth that she's expecting one day. Elizabeth believes she's past the season of birthing. That she's barren. Mary believes she hasn't yet reached the season of birthing. Yet we find within both of these human lives, God doing extraordinary things that would transform human history. I don't think you were listening. If you were, I don't think you were receiving. The scripture says, with God all things are possible. Some of you may think that you are too old, that your season is past, that the day is gone. The scripture says, with God all things are possible. Some of you may think that you are too young, that you haven't yet done the works that are necessary to see God birth a great work. The scripture says, with God all things are possible. You are not too old. You are not too young. You just need to be willing. Or Elizabeth was willing. Mary was willing. They believed God's word and God birthed yes. something in them you, that would transform human history. Praise God. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel of the Lord departed from her. And Mary arose and went in those days to the hill country with haste into the city of Judah. She entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Look at somebody and say, it's fixing to get even better. <laughs> I mean, really good. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth 
heard the greeting of Mary, the babe John that was in her womb leapt. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake. Oh, I'd love to know what she spake in that moment. Wouldn't you <laughs> like to have had a recorder right there? And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Amen. And whence is thee? What is this? Why is this unto me, lowly Elizabeth, that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? Glory to God. Yes. Mm. Do we really understand what happened here? Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the wife of an Old Testament temple priest. Jesus just made his first house visit. Now come on, seriously. Jesus, this is Jesus' first evangelistic mission. This is his first house call, his first house visit. He ain't even been born yet. He's still in mama's womb. He's not even seen the light of day, but he just made his first house call, and boom, Elizabeth got filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, she got baptized in the Holy Ghost because the baby Jesus walked in. And, and, and what else happened? Elizabeth had the, the, the realization, the anointing. She knew that the Lord had walked in the room. You see, because you, you don't get filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't get baptized in the Holy Ghost until you first get saved. Elizabeth had a confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ at that moment. It was filled in the Holy Ghost in that moment. I'm just telling you what the Scripture says. Elizabeth knew that the Lord had entered her home and entered her life. Her, her faith was so instant, it was so complete, that she was filled with the Holy Ghost in that moment. We know by the scripture, by, by the angel Gabriel, that the baby in her womb was filled. But not bad. Yeah, his, his, first, his first day of ministry, his first ministry trip, he's already gotten somebody saved. He's got a couple people filled in the Holy Ghost. Jesus is on a roll. <laughs> he ain't even hit the daylight yet. She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb, Mary. And, and, and what is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? Literally, that the Lord should come unto me. This is what she's saying. For lo, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, she had ears to hear. She had ears to hear the call. She had ears to hear the greeting. As, as soon... As the sound of your greeting sounded in my ear, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. She was connected. Okay, so for those, again, that say that life doesn't begin until actual daylight birth, you've got a baby who's a few months old baptizing the Holy Ghost, a baby who's a few months older, neither one of which had left the womb. This is pretty impressive ministry. Amen? You got one baby in the womb baptizing another baby in the womb with the Holy Ghost. That's functional life from my book. I'm just saying. I, I, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb, and blessed is she that believed. Blessed are you for believing. Where there shall be a performance of those things which have been told unto you from the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed are you when you believe God's word. For the things that he has spoken unto you shall be performed. If you need to write it down on a piece of paper and hang it on the wall and look at it every day. If you need to confess it out of your mouth. Blessed are you, blessed am I, for the things that God has spoken unto us, they shall be performed. All things are possible yeah. with God. Amen. Mary goes into a song of praise. Worship. It's a good example for us. When we receive the word of the Lord, 
rather than waiting for the manifestation, it doesn't say that Mary waited for Jesus to be born and to do a few miracles that she could see and then began to worship. It says, when the word of the Lord came, Mary began to worship. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. You see, Mary believed too. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things. Holy is his name. His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats. And has exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall be filled. Remember the Beatitudes. Mary is praising and confessing them even now. He that hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and returned to her own house. That would be easily overlooked and seem not that significant if we had not eyes to see and ears to hear. Elizabeth was about six months pregnant. We know typical gestation for a person is about nine months. So, Mary comes with Jesus to Elizabeth about six months into the pregnancy and resides with Elizabeth for the next three months. We can infer from that until the time of her delivery. You see, Jesus didn't just come to fulfill the word, but he then covered the word. Jesus remained in the house with Elizabeth to make sure that that which she was pregnant with would come to pass. Amen. Somebody needs to get excited about Amen. that because God hasn't just released a word to you. He is now covering that word. He abides and dwells with you Amen. and he abides and dwells over that word and over that Amen. promise and he is abiding with you to see it performed. Amen. He is covering you. He is covering that promise and he is abiding with you until the time that it is done. Do not think that you have been forgotten. Do not think that you have been forsaken. Do not believe that you have been overlooked. Do not believe that God gave you something and then expected you to figure out how to work it out. He is with you. He is with me. He is with us to perform that which he has spoken. He has done it before and he will do it again. You're not too young. You're not too old. The promise is not too great. He is with us and he shall oversee it and see that it is performed if we will but Believe. Believe. Believe God. Thank you, Lord. Now, John was birthed, and fortunately for Zacharias, his mouth was open, and he was able to speak. And then we read in verse 67, the father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. I'm not sure if you see the math here. But from my perspective, there was three people in Zacharias' house. Zacharias, Elizabeth, and John. Jesus made one house call. It was his first house call. It was his first <laughs> ministry trip. And there were three believers in the house, and all three of them were baptized in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Let me help you with that math again. There were three people in the house. It was Jesus' first day of ministry. He had never been more experienced in ministry to human beings than he was today. It was his first invitation, his first altar call, his first prophetic word, his first appearance. There were three people in the house, and all three of them were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I know some would say that not everybody's supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. From that, I would infer that Jesus Christ expects that every time that he arrives in the house of a believer, that every time he arrives in the life of a believer, that everybody should be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come on. Yes. I'm not saying that you've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost to be saved. I'm just saying that he expects that every believer that gets saved should be filled with the Holy Ghost. I agree. And I know some say, well, that, that was then, this is now. God has changed. Even though his word says he doesn't change, he's changed. I know some would say that those gifts cease, even though the problems haven't ceased and all the other issues have. Nothing else has ceased, but those have ceased. They have not ceased. 
do, do we understand? Mm -hmm. Jesus is not even yet birthed in the light of day. These are not wacky Gentiles in Cornelius' house. <laughs> These are Old Testament temple worshiping righteous, upright Jews. And the baby Jesus shows up, and the whole house is filled with the Holy Ghost. If Jesus is in your house, it ought to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And everybody in your house ought to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And if they're not, believe that they will be. Amen. Confess that word. The promise is not just unto you, but unto your sons and your daughters. Just read Isaiah. Read the Word of God. Confess the Word of God. Believe the Word of God. There are people out there that are praying and crying out that their children would just get saved. Would you please stop and start believing that they will not just get saved, but they will get filled with the Holy Ghost. Because if Jesus shows up in a house, everybody should get filled with the Holy Ghost. Peter came to Cornelius' house. It doesn't say that the tall people got, got filled with the Holy Ghost and the short ones didn't. It doesn't say that the old people got filled with the Holy Ghost and the young ones didn't. It says Cornelius and his whole house. Yes. The people that did the dishes, yes. the gardener, they yes. all got filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It has Lord. always been God's desire that Lord every born-again believer be filled with power from on high to be His witnesses God. in this earth, Amen. that we be filled with the Holy Ghost, and He's Amen. been doing it since before He was born. If anybody didn't ever believe that Jesus Christ was the baptizer in the Holy Ghost, which, by the way, the Scripture says Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Jesus showed up. He wasn't even born yet. He was already baptizing people in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Jesus Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And when he shows up in your house, everybody in the house should get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Scripture says in verse 38, Blessed be the Lord of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Why is Jesus called a horn of salvation? Power. Because a horn is what they put the anointing oil in. They, they put the anointing, the oil which represented the anointing, they put it in a horn and they poured it out. Why is Jesus called the horn of salvation? Because salvation was in him. The, the spirit was in him. The anointing was in him. And when, he, when that work was finished, it, it, the finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross, why was he crucified? He was crucified so that his spirit could be poured out on all flesh. Yeah. So that the oil, the anointing that was in him could be poured Hallelujah. out on you and me. The same works that he did, Amen. these and greater still will we do, meaning more numerous, because we are more numerous in body. He was in one physical flesh, we are in multiple physical yes. flesh. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we are to be filled with his anointing, that his anointing, his power works through us, transforming Amen. this world for his purposes and his glory, so we can get on to the next age. Praise, Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Just Bible. Zacharias has a song of worship and praise, as does Mary. Verse 70. Zacharias spoke by his holy prophets. Or excuse me, for the house of David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which had been since the world began. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. It's God's word. Amen. Come on, it's God's word. Amen. It's God's word that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Amen. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember thy holy covenant. The oath which he swore unto our father Abraham. That he would grant unto us. This is not just for Israel. The promises unto Abraham were not just for Israel. If we are born again Gentiles... We are partakers of the Abrahamic covenant. Everything promised in the covenant of Abraham to Israel is promised to us. We are, we are one people, one nation, yes. one new man in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore unto our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him with fear in holiness, in righteousness before him all the days of our lives. This man is prophesying because he is filled with the Holy Ghost. He is speaking the truth of the Word of God. We are to live 
with fear and reverence, serving our God in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. Amen. By all the days of our life, he meant on Sundays. That, that's really how that <laughs> translates from the original language. No, he meant Sunday. He, he meant all the days that end in a Y. All right? Let's just put it that way. All the days that end in a Y, we are to serve him in holiness, righteousness, uprightness, every day of our life. And your child shall be called the prophet of the highest, for you shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. He's speaking of John, but he's speaking of us. We are now sent into the world in the spirit of Elijah. It's a pattern. God loves patterns. The father Abraham sent forth his son Isaac. And from Isaac came Jacob. There was a manifestation of the covenant with Isaac, but there was a greater manifestation with Jacob. God the Father sent forth Elijah, but there was an Elisha that mm -hmm. came afterwards. Elisha did twice the miracles, twice the anointing, the double portion, twice the mantle on Elisha as Elijah. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Jesus the Messiah, God in the flesh, came to fulfill the prophecy and to fulfill the type and shadow as Elisha, the greater anointing. And then Christ was crucified. Christ, one man, one God in the flesh, the forerunner of you and I who are now sent Amen. to be one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, for the Messiah comes again. He's not coming this time riding a donkey. A king came in that day riding a donkey because he came in peace. The next time he comes, it'll be riding a horse. A, a king came riding a horse because it was time to make war. He will not come meek and humbly and lowly this time as he did last time. He will come a conquering king. He will come with the armies of heaven. Victory will be sure. Victory will be swift. And for those of us who are in the Lord, it will be glorious. And for those who are without, there is not words to describe how grievous that time shall be. You, child. You, man. You, woman. You, Rhea. You, Chris. You, Gabriel, you, Joel, each of you, you shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. I shall go, you shall go. We shall go in the anointing and the power of his spirit before him to prepare his way, to give knowledge of the salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. That through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness yeah. and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And this child John, he grew and he waxed strong in the spirit. And he was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Luke 2 tells us that the child Jesus waxed and grew strong. He grew in favor with men and with God. They have had their season in this Christmas story. It is now our season in this Christmas story. Let us wax and grow strong yes. in the things of God. Yes, Lord. Let us Very go strong. forth yeah. into this world proclaiming Make ye straight. Make ye right the way of the Lord. Let us cry into the wilderness. It doesn't say cry into the church pews. It doesn't say cry into your home groups. It says let us cry into the wilderness. Make ye straight, prepared and ready the way of the Lord for the King cometh. Soon. Yeah.